welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly discussion with practitioners around the world. Uh, today, I'm joined by three great coaches from three very different countries. Of Coy Smith, uh, it's an under 15 coach in the Grenada FA. We have Helen Nkwacha, who's uh, just flown in to the Faroe Islands to take on a role of head of football with a, with a club on the island. And of Yasmin Hussein, who uh, sort of uh, coaching, I can't remember the full number, I said it was sort of eight or nine clubs. I think you're sort of a I did, I did. <laughs> at one time or another, but we'll, yeah. we'll get the full details on, on that in a moment. Um, before I introduce you today's uh, coaches, let me just share my, uh, just say I want to quickly I'm share my screen with you um, to tell you a little bit about today's uh, running order. So there we go. So today's topic, changing a culture to create better coaching. Um, as always, Sunday session will be uh, a discussion of two halves. The first half, we'll kind of focus on the, uh, the, the culture side of things. So how Koi, Helen and Yasmin viewed their football cultures as, as players uh, and sort of how they were coached, how they saw the coaching style through their players' eyes. And we'll slip flat, flip that over to see yeah, how things are now, now that they've taken on the coaching roles. Then the second half, we'll dive a little bit deeper into how they operate as coaches, so how they're interacting within the coaching environments they're in, how they've adapted themselves to that, and then looking beyond to the future, uh, the challenges that they're currently facing, what barriers there are to their own personal development as coaches. But so we can get a lot deeper into those discussions and you can start asking your questions let me start introducing you to today's guest. So we'll start with Yasmin, who's uh, not a million miles away from me uh, in, in Essex, I believe, Yasmin. Yep. Yeah, I'm in Essex, Tuddle Heath. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I wonder if, um, to kick us off, um, just share with us a little bit your, your football pathway, just in terms of, yeah, your playing pass uh, and how you got into coaching yeah so um i've been coaching just over three years um i was one of the few that did the specific tailored course by the sxfa and muslim sports association to get more bme women into coaching um so i started off coaching with them volunteering there for a two years. Uh, I think they put me in touch with Fremford Clubs where I did my, uh, started my coaching journey, um, coaching boys five to six years uh, old, um, did about three months with them, um, which then I left and joined Colbuck Royals, uh, coached with them for two and a half years and uh, coached girls from under 12s. Then I rejoined back with Fremford Clubs uh, about two years ago. Uh, coach for them now. I do uh, three different um, groups. I do the under 12s, uh, under 14s, 15s, uh, ladies session uh, with Muslim Sports Association and also um, with the uh, ladies session for the um, Cranford Clubs. Also do some with the Leighton Orient Trust uh, under 12s and their ladies session. Wow, so you're keeping yourself very busy. A uh, lot, of, lot of coaching sessions going on there. I'm looking forward to hear <laughs> a lot more about how, how they look. Um, so from chilly-ish England, uh, sort of fly across the Atlantic to warmer climes in Grenada, where we have Coy Smith. Coy, how are you today? I'm okay. I'm fine. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Coy Smith. I'm from the lovely island of Grenada, located in the Caribbean. Um, I started playing football at age 13 for the national team. Um, I played for over five years. I played for 
U14, U15, U17 team. Um, I played for the Nationals women team at just age 13. Um, I think football here yeah, is growing a lot and I can't wait to share the experience with you guys. Um, I, I am now transitioning over to a female soccer coach. Um, and I think this broadcast will enhance and give me a lot of knowledge that I need to use going forward as a coach. Oh, we certainly, certainly hope so. Um, if anyone is going to help with that, I think it's going to be Helen Nequatcha, who uh, <laughs> 10 years of experience of, of coaching um, has led now to the Faroe Islands. But uh, Helen, um, yeah, what's the, what's the weather report on the Faroe Islands today? Oh, it's, um, it's similar to how it's been um, for nearly a month. Uh, so right now, I actually went for a run this morning and I thought that would be the last thing I ever did, ever. I nearly got blown into whatever water is next to where I'm living. Very, very windy, very windy here. Oh yeah, obviously the wind has blown you to uh, the Faroe Islands, but uh, yeah, for now, if you could just share yeah, the journey that's led you there. Where, where did that football pathway begin for you? and? What have been the stops in between? Um, well, I I've, I used to play. I, I finished. Um, I retired in 2010 um, due to injury, and um, just as I was about to retire, because I knew I was getting old anyway, so um, I'd already started transitioning into coaching. So I just coached the um, the under 16 girls at the club that I played for at the time. Um, so when I when I was forced to quit playing then I, I was able to concentrate more on uh, on coaching so I started coaching and that was that would have been like you know 10 years ago now um, I am from South London I did my only bit of coaching in and around London um, around Essex and Kent um, and I left the UK about seven years ago um, and I've done some coaching across different states in North America and um, I did three years coaching in China um, and then I went back to America and over literally the last month I um, have just started a new role here in the Faroe Islands. What is, what is the full role you have? What's the club you're working for? I work for a club called TB, which is the oldest club in the, uh, in the island. And um, it's the premier, premier division club. So they play in the top flight. Um, the games are televised. Um, they've got a real strong community um, following. Um, every young person who lives on the island, it's a population of 2,000. So everybody knows everybody and everybody is um, really connected with the club. Um, it's a very safe place. It's a very family orientated place. Um, and they, they've got a real desire to just um, make sure that everybody's included within the club. Everybody that, that lives here, it becomes part of the club and remains part of the club. Oh, fantastic, sounds great. So we're getting, uh, we're sort of um, learn a little bit more about the, the cultures that you're you're coaching in directly uh, i think we'll start with yasmin so i'm gonna yeah. hand the uh, the screen over to yasmin for your presentation this evening and yeah, yeah tell us a little bit more about the the culture that you're coaching in yeah, that's fine just bear with me a second this is all new to me yeah uh, okay all right Right. Yep, that's it. Okay, um, yeah, so I'll start off with the barriers I faced. So um, when I was younger, I used to play football. I used to play with my uh, brothers, his friends, um, 
the kids on the street, local street, we always used to just play together. At the time, it was seen as a male sport. None of my friends were interested in doing it. They used to call me a tomboy. I wasn't bothered, so I just carried on playing. The boys accepted me to play with them. It wasn't an issue, so I played. Uh, played about four or five years, got to the age of about 13, and my dad was saying, look, People are talking in the community, you know, your auntie was saying that, you know, there's, you're the only girl there. There are about 10, 11 boys, you know, it just doesn't look right. It's just, you know, it's an age now, Can you know, I think you should give it up. So I was really upset. Um, I mean, I've always been into sports. I used to be in the um, school netball team. My dad was okay with that because obviously it was a female coach. It was in a female setting. He said, find yourself a club like that. You can do it. See if your school does it. School had no football teams for girls, nothing local. Um, so he said, you know, let's try. I looked everywhere, couldn't find anything. So basically my barriers was the lack of female but for um, coaches in a female environment. Um, and it was seen as, at the time, you know, a, a sports for boys. So I think they didn't have the demand for it. So I, do, I understand why they didn't have such setups at the time, you know, because even my friends, if I tell, come on, let's play, they say, no, you go, you know, you go and play, and we don't want to play. So it was something that the girls, for some reason, weren't interested in, and it was seen as a boy sport. So um, so there was no luck in finding anything. Um, there was no one around. I've never seen any other girls playing football or anything. I was just the only one. Um, there was no role models, no one to look up to and say, you know, so-and-so has done it. And then after what and you kind of accepted it, I couldn't find anything. I just stopped playing. And it's something I've always liked. I mean, a part of me was missing, but it's something that I had to accept because the community were just talking and it was, I did feel bad for my parents. They kept getting the stick, you know, and he did feel bad for me because it's something I enjoyed and the joy, it gave me a lot of joy, but he's like, look, you know, you're getting to age, everyone's talking. It's just, you know, then I kind of accepted and thought, you know what? He's probably right, just give it up. And I just left it there. Yep, so next is how have the barriers changed? So like I said, over time, the cultural views have changed. Um, the auntie that was giving my dad stick now is saying, oh, it's really good because she wants to give it her daughter to get in. Um, she had a daughter and she said, you know, it's really good what you're doing. Because at the time when I was growing up, we were all active, we were all on the streets. They didn't need, they thought the kids are, you know, active. So now the kids are all indoors. They're looking for sessions to get them involved. And like, oh, we're looking for a female coach. What you're doing is so good now. So completely changed. So, you know, the stigma attached to it is gone now. So, um, so it's good um, and there's a lot of more opportunities. So most clubs have now a girl session, um, girls, um, you know, female coaches doing the girl sessions. If you look around, you, there's bound, you're bound to find something in your area or, you know, close by. Um, yeah, so I think, and um, there's more role models. So there is more people coming through. Like when I started, I didn't really hear of any other ones, but now so many more coaches are coming through or want to get into coaching. So yeah, they're seeing that, you know, it, there is more, um, it's inspiring the next generation. So um, yeah, and then also the media, sorry, that's gone. The media, um, a lot of uh, positive things about women football in the media is growing, a lot of intention. Uh, FA are doing a lot of things to encourage it. The World Cup, female World Cup was a good um, success. So there's a lot of media attention now on women's football. So uh, my coach, Ray, so I did uh, the FA BME course that was done by Essex FA and Muslim Sports Association, because uh, that's just over three years ago now I've been coaching. So I started off with Muslim Sports Association. Uh, the, the session I did there was social, so sort of um, indoor football. Women used to come and play indoor football. Uh, I coached there in total uh, for three years, I'm still doing the Friday sessions there. I think Yashmin put me through to Fremford Clubs uh, where I was under Neil Opta. He worked um, like a mentor, um, he helped me. I learned my original, my coaching um, skills or gain knowledge, confidence he built on that, um, gave me the confidence. I worked there for about three months before he said he thought a better opportunity for me to um, came because it was, uh, 
boys session I was doing at Frankford Club, they didn't have a girl set up at the time. I was offered at Colbert Royals, uh, this female session, and I think there was more better opportunity for me to do that. Um, so I went there to Colbert Royals, I coached there just until before lockdown I stopped because uh, um, so I was there for three years. Uh, Leighton Orient, I'm still with them. I do the under 12s and I do the ladies sessions for them. And um, yeah, so at the, currently um, at Fremford, I do their uh, female sessions. I do the girls, I think it's the under 12s, under 13s, 16 plus. Um, I'm also I'm their female development officer. Um, part of the London FA Council member and in the Women and Girls Advisory Group. Okay, the breaking the barriers. So as a coach, okay, so um, I had to, most of the things I had to do is build on confidence. So a lot of my women, sorry, so a lot of the women played indoor football. So when we started, it was indoor football social. So um, it was just basically run around, kick the ball, no rules really sort of thing. And we had to slowly, when we submitted a team, it was more competitive football. It was in a league. It was a lot of the girls were like, no, I can't. I don't think I'm ready. Didn't have the confidence. It was new. They've not seen anyone play football like them. So, you know, like them. So it's something completely different. It was really hard to get a team to commit to the league. It was a lot of, please come on, you can do it. Yeah, it's not gonna be that bad, try it, give it a chance. Um, I had, you know, so working on that, giving them the confidence that they are good and they can, you know, learn and play competitive football. Um, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, so be a role model and to inspire other um, players um, to uh, become coaches. So um, at Frankfurt Clubs, what we're doing now, we're getting our players have enrolled to the 100 FC coaching program. So where we're trying to get our players to become coaches. Um, so I think at the moment, some of them have done this new course called BT Playmaker course. So I think there's about eight of them have completed that. Uh, next month, they will be doing the new course um the new level one course so hopefully we'll get more coaches from our own players um and in um, coaching um also we being a mentor for those um interested in coaching and just helping them guiding them um also catering their needs so what are the barriers so a lot of the girls were had the issues with kits so they were uncomfortable with the kits they thought you know it has to be a certain way you have, they have to look a certain way so we kind of got for our teams we got like larger kits um modest wear so they're comfortable in what they wear um so if they wanted to we had the session of indoor outdoor so if they weren't comfortable and ready to do outdoor um, football competitive football they still had the indoor until they got the confidence and they were ready to move on to outdoor competitive football. Okay, so for my conclusion, so um, female football is growing. Um, there's a lot of growth, like I said, um, in the media, you're seeing a lot more um, attention in the media. There's a lot of opportunities um, available for females to get involved in coaching. And not only for, um, coaching, there's journalism, there's a lot of things for women now to get into if they're interested in that in, in the football industry. Um, there's more role models. I've seen a lot more now, a lot of coaches coming through. So um, that's positive uh, visibility so you're seeing more um, more you see the more um, girls are going to come through and the FA like I said coaching program you have the BT playmaker you had 100 FC and they a lot of because um, when I did the FA course I didn't receive much support so there is now a lot of support coaches get get from um, after completing it. So a lot of the times the women have done, the females have done this coaching badges and have just left it and they've not been given that support they needed. I mean, I was lucky in the sense that Frankfurt Club and Muslim Sports Association have guided me and supported me. Um, so i um, been lucky in that sense, but there's a lot of people that haven't been lucky from the 15, I could say probably about three or four carried on coaching and the rest hadn't got the support they needed. But I think that is something that FA have addressed and they are doing that. So um, hopefully the people that do qualify um, get the support to continue doing it. I think that's my presentation done.
Thanks, Yasmin. That was great. Um, and lots of uh, great points that we can uh, jump into uh, once we once we begin uh, our discussion. Um, but before that, we'll uh, I'm going to hand the screen over to Koi Smith. So Koi, tell us all about what's uh, happening in Grenada. Okay, um, first we're starting off with American Sociological Association defines culture as a language, a custom, a belief, rules, art, knowledge, collective identities and memories developed by members of all social groups that made their social environment meaningful. With that being said, every culture has a unique and outstanding background that classifies them as different to each other. All coaches here in Grenada have, a different, have different coaching ways. But the one thing we all have in common is how to recognize the way in which we can make our coaching skills unique. These coaches use these pathways, our experience. Experience is used to refer to the past event knowledge and feeling that makes up someone's life or character. The experience you encounter as a child can and will reflect how you view your environment, which can be something good or bad, which leads to our next pathway, our beliefs. Beliefs are convictions that people hold to be true. Individuals in society here have, a, have specific beliefs. They take these beliefs and turn them into actions. Our actions, according to Max Weber, an action is social. If the acting individual takes account of the behavior of others, an example of social action here can be bringing awareness of cultural barriers and problems such as sign and symbols in coaching and behavior and beliefs. With these three steps, we include results. Results are like a fruit that grows from a tree. When you, plant, when you plant, the ending product is enjoying the fruit. Now, cultural diversity in com communication. As we focus on the steps to changing a culture to provide better coaching, we also have to concentrate on the major challenges that affects cultural barriers here in Grenada. One of these key challenges that affects soccer here in Grenada is cultural diversity in communication. One of these diversities is ethnicity. Ethnicity refers to shared culture, such as language, practices, and beliefs. An example of ethnicity that players here in Grenada face is language. Language is a symbolic system through which people communicate and culture is transmitted. Most coaches here in Grenada express their opinion as spoken communication their body language, their tones, and their tones are involuntarily transmitted. Their body language, my bad, their body language and their tones involuntarily transmit non-verbal communication to their players. For instance, a coach will open his arms, shout, point a finger at a player's face, makes a disappointing face, or as we say in Grenadian terms, he would skin his face up because he or she doesn't pass the ball properly. Usually, these nonverbal communications are getting across as negative. These traditions and customs are passed on for generation to generation. The harsh part about it are these customs are being passed on in this way. So here in the picture, we have a parent talking to a child. When a child is at home, the parent would shout to the child just to do a chore, or they would yell at the child, or they would beat them. And when they go to the field, they receive the same treatment, which leads a child to be depressed and oppressed. And now they don't have anyone to turn to when soccer was just 
they won't get away from the experience they have at home. Our next slide is communication. Psychologists tell us that 93% of communication is nonverbal. So that means the majority of what we communicate with others isn't coming from out of our mouth, but it's coming from our body language. A coach's body language, tone, and facial expression can be determined, can determine how a player interpret the message of the game of soccer. So now, cultural changes, cultural changes that affects effective communication and coaching skills. The coaching style, the coaching style here in Guinea used to be a coach pointing his finger and shouting at a player just so they could understand. So now it's coming to the coach asking questions, saying, do you understand? Would you like me to explain? Cultural changes that enhance effective communication skills here in Grenada. Coaches change the negative tradition, coaching style towards players. The narrative where the game is first and the individual is now changed over to the players first, then the game after. So the association I play for is the Grenada Football Association. Changes made by the Grenada Football Association are, they are now offering national players who have paid their dues by playing with the Grenada national team, providing them with scholarship and internship all around the world. The Grenada Football Association saw that changes needed to be made to enhance the betterment of soccer here in Grenada, to change their culture to provide better coaching by granting female coaches with the opportunity to go abroad and coach with the UK International Soccer Program based in the United States of America. Thank you. Thanks, Coy. It was uh, fantastic. Uh, nice little insight into the uh, coaching culture in Grenada as was, and uh, and the and the changes you're looking to bring about, which we will discuss no doubt after we uh, had this presentation from Helen. Thank you. Let me just try and share the screen. <clears throat> Okay, so um, the first thing, um, hopefully this will work without a glitch. Um, so I tried to think about the different, obviously the different places that I'd worked in, but one thing that um, I realized was that even though I spent um, a few years working over in the States, every state was different. Every state had a completely different um, approach to to the game and a different approach to how they liked their players to be worked with. So one of the images here is a, one of the U10 teams that I worked with uh, in Connecticut. Now, that environment, the culture there was that despite um, the talent potential, the, the way in which they wanted their players to be worked with was a lot more kind of um, autocratic, a, a, a bit firmer, and that was not consistent with the experience that I had as a coach in terms of my education back in England. So something that I realized was that every state in the US had a completely different outlook on how we should be working with the players. So I had to try and figure out what was, um, what did I mean in terms of uh, culture and, and values? So for me, um, culture is how yeah. we do something, you know, um, the values is what's important to the different environments. So identifying the culture, so the first thing was, when I worked in China, it was very, very enjoyable, very enjoyable experience. Um, however, football's brand new in China. 
it, it's not seen as a, as a viable uh, career choice. The main career choices there is uh, they want you to be, a, they want their children to be professionals in terms of um, maybe becoming doctors or going into engineering. But the idea of football wasn't seen as something that they wanted their child to take part in because it wouldn't lead them to the career that they were hoping for for the child. Now, because of what they're used to in terms of um, it's it's a it's a it's a country where they do listen to their leader a great deal. You, you're not encouraged to have a, a to air different opinions. So when we're working with these players and the players we worked with was between the ages of six and seventeen. Now our job was to try to identify a player for the Chinese national team. And part of doing that is when you're working with young players, obviously it's got to be age appropriate. So working with young players, and we know that we're trying to find a player who has that potential to operate at that level, we have to give them an opportunity to show creativity. And that was quite a difficult thing to do because showing creativity wasn't something that they were accustomed to as a culture um, at that age, uh, a person between the age of six and 17, especially doing uh, any sort of group activity, they had to show that they understood um, how to operate within a team. And their aim was always to please the teacher or to please the coach. So as football coaches, we were trying to see who's the creative player, but we had to understand the culture isn't looking for creativity. The culture is looking for people who can follow rules. So that was the biggest challenge that we found. And also um, most of the children there, they spent a lot of time with their grandparents. So that did impact the activities that they took part in. So you wouldn't necessarily have a child who was used or accustomed to going out to play with their peers, running, jumping, stopping, landing on the ground, getting back up again, twisting, turning, because they're with their grandparents and that's, that's who's looking after them. So the physical development, we had to place a different emphasis on that. And then we had to help them understand that we wanted them to be creative and it was fine. Um, I said, check and check again. Now, that's also, a, that's, my, that's part of my football language. So confirming culture, check and check again. So I love the fact that back in England, we've got this emphasis on education because you know we realize that we haven't won uh, the senior team, senior men's team haven't won the World Cup since 1966. And so the emphasis on education is that, right, let's find out what other countries are doing who have shown performance better than ours and they revitalized and completely reshaped the way that the FA are delivering um, workshops and courses. And you mentioned, um, Jasmine mentioned the, uh, the Playmaker course. I've done that and it's an excellent course. So in England, we're into education, um, but I've spent a lot of my time now in the US. Uh, and what's different in the US is so many coaches have got so many strong opinions. And with so many strong opinions, um, it, it, would, it, would, it can dictate the environment, which might be a conflict with what, what the association is saying. And I, I found that that happened less in England but it definitely, definitely was very prevalent um, in my experience in the, in the US where there were very strong opinions and sometimes it was um, challenging for players to be developed a certain way. Even though, to be fair, the US, they're very competitive and I think competition is something that maybe we should be looking to explore more back home in England you know, um, just being aware that competition is, is good, you know, and getting our players to understand that, yeah, you're going to be challenged, your coach is going to challenge you, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. So um, this little image here is me at the time speaking with my assistant. And I think uh, the conversations that you have with people within your football environment, I found that 
I started off earlier on in my coaching as I found it very difficult to have those conversations with with families and with fellow coaches and uh, and as I've tried my best to do a little bit more research and education and and more coaching um, but focusing on what my coaching was for so the why aspect to my coaching it's helped me try to embrace the idea of being a bit more collaborative um, without losing my own um, beliefs but being open to the conversation with people so that can help to to alter or adjust um, my mindset to a culture where I'm able to have the conversations with the with the assistant who sometimes the assistant is is more right than I thought I was. So it, it's well worth listening to and, and being open to change my opinion and change um, change my attitude a little bit. Um, in China, I found that sometimes the players were right and I was wrong. So, you know, they were, they were very, very clever. They learned very quickly. And it taught me that, you know what, Helen, sometimes you, you can learn a lot by actually asking a player or listening to them or watching them and taking a little step back so I learned that from China. And that's why when I am having this conversation with my assistant, I'm having a conversation because prior to working there, I was in China where I was taught about collaboration. Um, now, stay consistent and, and stay true. So be consistent, be true is just the case of trying not to do like some people would call it like butterfly coaching where you're flitting from one idea to the next to um, like just try to stay focused um, so in in China if we're trying to find a player who's suitable for the first team so, sorry suitable for the national team we have to stick to the structure so where I am right now is about encouraging the people around me to be true to our plan despite it being brand new to their culture to have this type of plan um, but, but in order for us to meet our long-term goals, we have to try to make sure we stick to um, a set plan. Opinions are fine, but just try to stick to a set plan as well. Um, so I think it's about having confidence and having confidence in exploring ideas. And I think that people who have ideas have energy and they can help to ingest the, the culture help to make the culture a little bit more fruitful you know so even though I'm saying that the Americans have strong opinions in a way what's the harm in opinions you know it's good to listen to things so I always try to listen to my players now and that's how I've been influenced by um by the different cultures that I've uh, that I found myself working in so there in this this little image is one of my players in um in Chicago so I used to send them all these videos and I put a lot of pressure on my players all the time um, and then you've just got to try and find out their personalities and and who can take what type of pressure so this particular player she's watching one of my videos just talking about tactics and then I was able to learn that she wanted more information so it was my job to try to get more information that I could give to her at the right time because when she went home, that's what she did. She didn't sit there and just, you know, she wasn't on her iPad just playing games. Or she was actually, she wanted more because at, at 13, she, she wanted to play and wanted to learn. So that's, uh, that's how I learned a bit with these, uh, these different places that I've worked in. And I'm just gonna try to press the correct button to stop the screen share. Brilliant. Thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, well, maybe we could uh, rewind a little bit now then with you, Helen, and sort of all the way back to your playing days. Just wonder what your, if you can sort of re recall uh, sort of through your playing career from being a youth player to senior player and kind of what you saw as being the prevalent coaching culture of the time. What were the kind of coaching personalities that you experienced as a player? Um, well, I think now um, we embrace the idea of being like having a growth mindset 
and it, it's the opposite to the experience that I had with with my coaches when I played. Um, I, I never, I, I was kind of put into the pigeonhole as being the fast player, and and I was the fast player. But it, what I found was that um, it meant that often my coaches didn't necessarily engage me with the information to help me um, develop other areas of my game. So as I got older and I, I wasn't the fast player anymore, um, luckily I was able to, to learn how to play differently, but it wasn't something that came from the coaches. So I didn't necessarily have, um, I didn't necessarily believe that I, I got a lot of information to develop myself as a, as a player when I played. I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't particularly amazing anyway, but um, but I think that the educational side and the, the developmental side was um, wasn't really a high focus. And Koi, um, still still very much a player, but in terms of your youth days. And, and certainly part of the culture that you represented to us in your presentation was, was that kind of reflect the sort of coaches you had as a, when you first started playing football at 12, 13, 14, that it was very much the coaches talking down to you, that communication was a, was a big problem for you? Um, yes, it was a big problem for me, but I think that as I grew older, I became opinionated and I started asking questions. And then I saw that all oh, this need, needs to change. And when you were then as a player asking questions of the coaches, I mean, what was the reaction? I mean, this is something that also from what you've shown us in the presentation, it's not just a coaching culture, it's much the culture of the island, of the adult. Yeah is kind of the, the, the one and only voice in any sort of interaction with a, with a young person? Yeah. So in our culture, um, this is seen as rude or disrespectful. You should just do as you're told, or then you're seen as the bad child. When you're then, as a player, you're kind of expressing yourself, what is the reaction you were getting from your coaches? Um, some of the reaction would be probably to, to be mean to me, like the whole session that we would play. I just shout for no reason, like, if you know you and the coach had a disagreement, then you need to go in that session and be extremely perfect. Because the minute time you make a mistake, then they will be on you. You'll be shouting and just doing the most, like making you look like the bad student, just because you gave your opinion. Because you say, no, sir, I think this is wrong then you would look as a bad player to them. In terms of playing, Yasmin, uh, you sort of grew up in a culture where, yeah, those barriers were, were, were pretty, pretty clear. That there just wasn't the opportunity there for you to play just due to a, a lack of female, female coaches. Yeah. Um, Matt, does that then I mean you're probably not a lone story then? There'd be lots of women of your age who simply just would have loved to have played football but just didn't have the opportunity. Yeah, it's true. Um, and it was uh, the stereotypes as, as well. It, I mean, a lot of girls wasn't actually interested in playing football. I couldn't drag my friends. So it was something that, as in even my youngest daughter, you said, Mom, it's a boy sport. So I think that's kind of still have that perception of seeing as a boy sport so at the time there was no demand for it so I mean they weren't needed to have a session for girls um, at the time so um, I think yeah um, there will there would be a lot of girls that do want to play it but with the lack of opportunity but I think it's slowly changing now um, 
people are seeing it as a more girls are doing it more seeing it's more visible isn't it so it is um more opportunities are available but at the time there wasn't nothing for me nothing um no sessions for girls or any female coaches so yeah I mean, Phil, well, I'll stay with you, Yasmin, but I think the area where all three of your stories are very similar, although, you know, as players, very different. It seems uh, in terms of going into that coaching side of things, there was no real role models for you to attach yourself to, certainly for, yeah. for you, Yasmin, because the, the female coach just didn't, didn't exist. Um, so one is, how has that opportunity arisen for you but two once you've started on this coaching pathway I mean what does what are the reference points that you're able to sort of hang your development on yeah um yeah like you said there wasn't a role model um there wasn't anybody I could look up to or anything but um I mean I have been fortunate uh, with having really supportive people around me um from fed clubs I had Neil Okta um he's a coach um so he's always helped me supported me and I used to just pick up sort of things from him I added my own sort of things because there is a difference between a male coach and a female coach. And first I was under him. I was a player before I was a um, coach um, manager at the time. So um, I did find that the girls, they always used to message me to tell him to pass it on. So they found it easier to speak to me. Um, they found it a lot easier. Um, so, I mean, my with me is I have a bit of, because I've not had any role model or anyone to look up to. I've not had a female coach coaching me. So it's just taking bits of other coaches and adapting it to my own and seeing how it works and sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, and sort of pick up on that theme with, with you, Koi, as, as well. I mean, who, who are the sort of role models then you've had, sort of the coaches you you had as a player of, of ones that you kind of using them as a bad example this is kind of you're looking at them i don't know it's kind of like a negative role model of this is not the coach i want to be but okay. then you need people around you as, as yasmin says that support to allow you to be the coach that you think players deserve i mean what is the support system around you at the grenade and fa that is allowing you this opportunity yeah. Um, for example, right? Um, there is this group of girls, group of football girls, and um, well, it's now a club called the St. Andrews Vanguards. And these girls come from all different area from this parish. Um, and the team manager that's just that one person that they could count on. Um, so they see her as a role model, as somebody that they could look up to because she created a space where they could feel comfortable and even come to, the, come to her and ask her for advice. What do you think I should do? Not only, but she also encouraged them to do better. So at home, they could have the worst day. But when they do come to the session, she would be like, how was your day? Not knowing that nobody asked them that since they woke up this morning. So yeah, for sure. For, for, for yourself, Helen, obviously um, you've sort of kind of had a, out of all, all three of, the three of you, your, your playing days were a little bit longer. You'd have experienced a lot more coaching uh, and a lot more playing. So, I mean, was it just a case of you feeling that as someone who played the game that you just wanted to give something back or, or were the coaches along the way who you've kind of seen as role models who've kind of inspired you to, to become co a coach? I'd, I'd, never, um, I'd never thought about coaching until... Um, like the last club I played for, the, the coach who had enticed me away from my, my club prior to that is the one who I'm so glad that he, he seemed different. That, you know, some people, they kind of look beyond the, the facade of what people see. So he was one of those people that seemed to just look a little bit further 
he didn't have necessarily deep conversations with me, um, but I think he just saw something else about me that I didn't even realize I had. So if it wasn't for, um, for, my, for my old coach, Bart, um, when I, I, uh, I wouldn't have considered coaching. And, um, and the coaches that, well, the main coach that was a massive influence on, on my staying in coaching was Hope Powell. You know, she's like, she played at the club that I played at for a while. And when she was England manager, she created a women's program. So it's one of those things, you know, those people that um, they don't just, you know, you might be doing well with whatever you're doing, but in a way you kind of have a responsibility when you know you're part of a marginalized group, you do have to have a social conscience about paving and making opportunities for other people. So if she hadn't have created a program, then on the program, she was so hands-on. It made you realize that right, this, this is tough. Um, I'm probably going to keep making lots of mistakes, but having an opportunity to see her coach, to know she exists, to know the level she can operate at, and then for her to create an opportunity by, by making a program which is nationally available for female coaches at the time, um, that was the reason that I, I, I stayed coaching. You know, without seeing a Hope Powell, um, I wouldn't have stayed coaching. That's uh, one great role model there in Hope, Hope Powell. Um, I think it was the thing that's coming out, and it's, you know, it's, I think it's the same for coaches at all levels, but that first thing of when you're creating that environment, when you're for that training environment, the learning environment for your players is, is about making it a safe environment for them to make them feel comfortable so that they're able to express themselves. Um, so we'll start with, with you, Helen. I mean, in terms of that, that, what is that first thing? What is that first interaction with your players? How is it that you're looking to make that environment, make your players feel comfortable coming in, putting the world out that's going on outside to one side and knowing that, right, this is a place where they can truly be themselves and express themselves as footballers? Um, I, I know what it's like to, to be the player that you... you you know, maybe you're not the best player and, and the coach maybe says one word to you every three weeks. <laughs> I know what it's like to be seen as the better player and having too much attention. So both had been uncomfortable for me. Um, whenever I work with players, I do try to keep that in the forefront of my mind. Like this is a young person. This is a person. Um, I put a lot of responsibility on my players and I'm very consistent with that. So the idea is that they are in charge of the environment and the learning and the development and the values and reinforcing it. Um, the tough thing is to get buy-in, you know, because if it's something that they've never had because they're used to the coach dictating, then they kind of don't want to be the ones to stand out and take the responsibility. So it's a case of me making them understand that, but I expect them to take responsibility because the world will expect it. You ain't gonna just float around. You know, people don't want you to melt into the background and you shouldn't. So I try to make players feel that I, they have got an input and their input does matter, you know, because sometimes I never felt that. And sometimes I noticed when other players were overlooked. So that's what I try to do. I, I give a lot of responsibility and I try to be consistent with that. Likewise, uh, Koi, that you and you're in a in a culture where at home children are used to sort of their parents telling them what to do and they do it. I guess the same culture is at school. So when they come to you for a coaching session, how is it you're able to encourage them to actually make them feel comfortable that I want to hear your voice, that you have an input in what we do? Um, first, the first thing I think I do is make them laugh, tell them a joke, laugh about something. Because I think that could change a whole mood. That could just change the environment completely. One small joke about something so minor could change the environment. And then I would say, 
create a game of your own and you explain it, you make up the rule of the game. And then they would ask, and then I would ask them, what's the rule? How did the game go? So these scenarios could just make them feel comfortable with you and just to ask your questions because you give them the opportunity to do something on their own so they could see how it is. I'm not giving them responsibility to coach themselves, but just to try something new and to be responsible. So to me, I think if a child has one small responsibility, then they would always ask questions. I mean, Yasmin, are these similar experiences that you, you, you're having as a coach and, and recognizing or obviously coming from with the players that you're working with that there requires a little bit more to make them feel feel comfortable so you sort of she mentioned um, you know having to respect the religious side of things so if you overstep that mark people are not going to feel comfortable yeah um, miss yeah like i said just basically cater for their needs what they want um make sure they're in a happy fun environment um you know, so you communicate e e easily with them um, so they can communicate with you as well. Once you have a good relationship and they're enjoying themselves, there's only one thing is good growth and development and just positivity. Sounds like, yeah, we're kind of getting a nice little picture of how, how you view, uh, are viewed coaching as one is from a playing side or certainly from Yasmin, what was missing um, and then putting yourself into that into that environment and, and taking on that role. But now mm. that you're in that environment, how are you finding yourself adapting and in those different environments? I know you started with the boys and I don't know for one reason, whether it's through choice or, or just how by chance that now you're very much just focused on coaching the girls football. So I just wondered how, maybe sort of tell me a little bit what you noticed the difference of being in a boys environment and a girls only environment. Yeah, so when I originally started my coaching at Frankfurt, it was boys. They don't had they didn't have any girl sessions, so I was in boys. Um, I think it was very hard for me. Um, I felt a bit intimidated. There's still this perception of she doesn't know what she's doing, and I felt like the parents were looking like, "Wait, I'm pay paying five pound a session, and I've got this female coach. Does she even know anything about football?" And with me is. I just qualified and I've gone straight into the deep end and it's like, wait, I've not done it for over 20 years. I, I don't didn't even have confidence because I knew I didn't have a lot of the knowledge, terminology to use. I'm like, then I said to my um, Neil at the time, look, can I shadow you? Because I'm not confident to be left on my own. At the same time, I did the Muslim Sports Association that was indoor football. There, it was just kicking the ball, running out, no rules. There's no technical, it was just having fun. They were just enjoying themselves. And then uh, that built my confidence. Neil gave me the guidance of what I needed. I shouted him for a bit. Um, and then when I went to Colbrook, they just left me on my own um, with a girl session. And I just did a lot of drills, looking, you know, researching. And then slowly I developed myself as a coach. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I found it easier to coach girls, a lot easier. I felt like, I don't know, they communicate better. They understand me better. They listen. The boys were more at that age as well. I did the 67, more boisterous, like wouldn't listen to you. And you're like, wait, you know, with the girls, they listen to and you tell them, like, you know, OK, can you be quiet? Let's go through the drills or what we're going to explain you. They'll they'll listen to you with the boys to get their attention, especially the age group I was doing. It was so much. And this is just new into coaching. It was a very difficult experience for me. And it did at times, if I didn't get the right support, I, I, I'll go back to girl session. I don't think, I don't know what I would have done if I would have carried on, but I did have doubts that, um, should I be here? Am I, you know, am I a coach? Can I even, you know, coach this, these groups? Can I even get them to develop? Can I, you know, have the confidence? And I think it took time, but it, I got there. Um, a lot more now I'm like I feel a lot confident and the girls they respect me I've got a good communication with them they communicate back with me and I can see them develop and stuff so I did prefer coaching the girls. And Corey within sort of the work you're doing with the in Grenada there's clearly there's 
coaches that you're not alone. There's a couple of other coaches, and I know through the work from the FA who are looking to change this coaching culture from from the image you have of the the pointing coach to the to the listening coach. Um, but there are still going to be those coaches who are still the pointing coaches. So just wonder when you're all in that environment together, how is that? How are you all adapting to each other? Or is it just a case of everyone just stays in the lane and as players, it's just pot luck who you get as a coach? I think it's both pot luck who you get as a coach and coaches stay in their lane. They wouldn't have much to say to you, but probably when you're not there, they would. So yeah, it's a mixture of everything. So the other coaches will have a lot to say about you when you're not there, but there's not a lot of, like say that conversation between coaches and sharing of ideas, that's not really happening yet. Yeah, um, criticism is like a big thing here. People don't like to get criticized at all. Um, they take it as a bad, most people. So for you to tell somebody, oh, you did this wrong and you should do this, they would see you as oh, they want my job, so, something down that line. So one of our biggest, 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 biggest thing here is not being able to be criticized or not being able to take criticism. Even though it's good criticism, they can't take it, most persons. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, another way of adapting, adapting the language, how you how you frame those conversations, I guess, without it sounding like being direct criticism, which is never easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, Helen, sort of uh, to reflect a little bit back on Yasmin's early experiences and, and coaching both boys and girls. I mean, how, how have you found that? How have you adapted from working with both male and female teams? Um, I, I tend to be the same, to be honest with you. Um, I've, I've always probably coached maybe 60, 40 in favour of boys. Um, most of my coaching has been with male players um, between the ages of like 12 and 16. Um, yeah, I, I just try and I just try to not treat them too different. Um, I, I don't. I don't really change much, to be honest with you. I'm. I'm not. I don't have. Uh, I don't have an issue with people thinking that there's a difference. Um, but I, I do have an issue with players behaving as if there's a difference, not if they're expecting the same thing. If if the if the players are expecting um, different outcomes then that's, that's not necessary. It may not be gender driven, you know, but if you've got a, a, a 14 year old girl and, and she's trying to get into the national team and then you've got a 14 year old boy and he's trying to get into the local county team or the national team, then if they've got the same ambitions, then they tend to have the same kind of um, developmental attributes that they still have to strive for the same things um on a personal level i'm kind of chatty anyway so you know but if it's if, if it's on if stay on task so really they they get the same style of coaching if they've got the same ambition if they haven't that's different that's where i have to mix it up a little bit on top of that there's the uh adapting yourself and into the cultures you're finding yourself in. Um, I mean, China, I think it's probably is, from the outside would seem as probably as uh, extreme as it could get for in weeks ago. Um, how do you put yourself into that culture where it is very different? To the one that you're used to living in is very different to what you're used to as a coach. Do you have to adapt yourself to the ways that your 
finding there? Or are you able to, again, sort of still have a large part of yourself and make, make that work as part of that coaching team? Yeah, I think, I think you do have to adapt. You have to because, you, you know, it's, it's one of those where you have to try and be flexible. However, um, what I found is that you just have to try your best to stay on task. Like, what are they expecting of, of me? If it's a case of, like, we, we want to find that six-year-old who, after 10 years, he is in the national team, then, then I, whatever the culture dictates, if it's going to meet the, the, um, the aims, then fine. But if it's clear that it doesn't meet the aims, then you have to, you have to change that. You have to stick with whatever, the, whatever you've been given as a script. Um, but if you, you know, for me, if I'm in, in a place and, you know, you 10 girls and, and you, you've got the technical director expecting them to be shouted at and screamed at, I'm like, actually, for the safety and well-being of these young people, I, I'm not going to adapt to your culture because in terms of looking after people, that it's wrong anyway. I, I, so I couldn't do that. But I think you have to mix it up, but you also have to know the aims. Um, China was okay because they they were they're quite simple and it, you know it's just a case of what what you want we want this okay and and then the results are is it clear that the player's improving and and you can quantify that by evidence you know, like you know in performance they they grade things based on where they rate in terms of competitions so if we were losing lots of games even at the age of 10 that was pressure and that was uh, something I'd never come across before, where you, usually you'd be like, oh, they're, they're nine and 10, isn't it great? No, if they're losing, it's not great because those players are representing like the future of, of China, even if they're just nine or 10. So I think it was just one of those where you just have to stay focused on whatever it is that they've been, they've, they've told you that they need. With yourself, um, Yasmin, coming into to coaching, did you have a clear mindset of what your values were going to be as a coach? Um, and, or have they evolved as you actually began sort of coaching, having working with young, young people? Um, I think a bit of both. I think it did evolve. Um, I did have a certain way I wanted to coach. Um, and then I kind of, because I've not done it, I changed a bit. I've taken a few from this person. I thought, no, nah, this doesn't work on me. I prefer this style because I did get told once my manager um, came and observed me and said, you're too quiet. And I said, I prefer not to always screaming on the sidelines and, you know, do this, do that. I prefer to observe only when they need it, I'll say it, and then have a good team talk and say, this is what, you know, you need to improve in the second half. And I find that the players preferred that way. So, I mean, different coaches have their different um, styles, but I think my style worked with my players and I do that. So I have two teams. So I have one in beginners team and an in, um, intermediate team. The way I coach them is both different because the beginners need more to be told when to run into space or what sort of things to do and they rely on a voice of my voice in you know telling them whereas the intermediate have more of freedom because they're experienced so I let them play with freedom and then I just point out what needs to be pointed out and um, so I mean I'm still on my journey I'm trying different techniques and then just see what really works um, yeah and evolving but I mean as long as my player is developing and I see growth then I think I'm doing it right and I do see it um, them, them developing and growing so I think um, I'm on the right track. And you have the similar sort of lines Koi that you're um, yeah a generation that's looking to bring change is that really at the forefront of your mind is your key purpose here? Or are your sort of values and your thoughts more simple in terms of just being a coach day by day? Um, no, I would have to agree with what Yasmin said. Um, I think my view go along her guidelines as long as the players have freedom. Yeah, I would agree with her. That's 
that's how I do my coaching. Um, so you sort of said um, there's not really that great amount of interaction with with the coaching fraternity at the moment. It seems to be two very distinct styles. But moving forward, mm -hmm. how can that change? How is there a merger? Does it need to be that you've just removed one style of coaching together and so you only have one way because some ways that can yeah if there's only one way of thinking can be a, a problem it's always good to have different voices and how is there a way that things can evolve how are you trying to work it so that all right everyone we want to hear everybody's voice there's not there's not just one way there's just there is our way Um, I just think that if the narrative of the game first and the player after changes to the players first and the game after, then the narrative of the other coaches would change. I mean, everybody would have their own opinion of what that change would be, but it wouldn't be as negative as it is now. In the US, your experience in the US, I mean, you mentioned in your presentation, Helena, that there's yeah, not really like a, like in many other countries where there's a central FA and everyone is coached the same way and has a similar kind of viewpoint. But in the US there, there was a lot of opinionated coaches who will do it their way. Um, what do you find, what were the pluses of that? And obviously what were the, the downsides? Where again, you've got lots of coaches with their own different styles and... Yeah, for sure. Um, to say that Grenada is very traditional and sticks to one culture, and the whole reason for us going over there to see the different culture. So the UK International Program, they take coaches from all over the world to come to coach the United States in different states there. And so you would be with different coaches every day and getting a grasp of what their technique and their styles of coaching are. You could, you could pick up the bad and good from that. And then you could learn something good out of it. So, yeah. I'm with you, Helen, um, being in certainly in the US where you there's probably coaching fraternity with lots of different opinions. How did you find that works? Were there big positives to have from that? Because you were getting exposure to different ideas on how to coach. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the NCAA, they, they do make the effort, you know, to, to provide education. Um, yet um, it, it's not the same as um, this is the fund which is being given to each club um, and there's lots of different statuses which are um, allocated and the status dictates um, obviously the level of play but the status is not a transparent process and it also is financially um, it can be uh, something that prevents someone participating. It's got nothing to do with whether or not the player's there because they can operate at that level, but they're there because they can pay for that level. So the whole idea of youth development, for me, I think I've got an idea on how the game should be played, but everyone's got an idea because we've all got a passion for, for, for the sport. But I don't wanna be around lots of passion for the sport because we're not trying to, um, we're, we're trying, well, for me, I would have thought like, what's the aim of the clubs? Uh, we're, we're trying to develop players who are happy in the community. What's the aim of the club? Oh, we're trying to develop players to get into the, um, you know, ODP or Development Academy or the MLS Academy or whatever it's gonna be. But that, if, if you've got all different opinions, then there's no exact way of how you probably developed the player, so you can't repeat it if you don't know because it's not 
been given any time for fruition, then you'll never be able to know the formula. And there is a formula, but because of opinions, you never ever agree on the formula. You know, so you've, and then you've got players that follow coaches everywhere because they don't like a club and it's like, but it's not about the coach, you know? So it, it's, um, for me, I, me personally, I want it, I want structure. Um, opinions are fine, but, but we've, we've all got opinions, you know? Um, I just think that obviously we're, we're trying to, if we're trying to develop a player, um, the opinions that probably have to take a bit of a back seat, you know, but um, that's that's the challenge that everyone talks about with the US. Um, so anyway, you've seen as we're kind of moving on to the challenges that everyone is facing then, um, where you've seen, which is probably a challenge, a lot of people in clubs where there are a number of coaches and you supposedly have a central purpose. How do you then creating that culture where right you can have coaches bring in their own individual ideas to it which is kind of shaping what you're doing as a group so that ultimately but what you're providing as coaches there is okay there is a central theme to it but we will allow a certain amount of individuality we'll bring other people's ideas on board how do you create that environment but one that's still in a situation where it's not completely out of control and everyone's just doing their own thing that there is still okay we're all buying in to the same area so this is where we're going to use your ideas I, I like the idea of creating programs you know like run things for six weeks monitor them review them check with the players um see how they feel what are the outcomes what first of all what is it we're looking to achieve as a long-term goal as a as an organization it's like we want coaches to bring different ideas it's like well okay then then we should have like a think tank and then uh, we know that we've got so and so amount of programs running every year but then we still need to have like um you know like a spine of how we work um but then we we, we do have an open mind to coaches bringing forward ideas for programs as long as it's um not something that stops if a coach goes because that's like if the coach leaves and they take their ideas because it's their intellectual property then the, then the, it's not to the benefit of the club or the players or the community so i, I think we should have ideas because you want players to be creative and you want them to be confident but i think as long as it's it belongs to the club and, it, and it's part of the club's um you know part of their identity that we do that I mean, where you're at, that you're in Grenada with your coaching journey, Coy. I mean, what are the what are the challenges? The main challenges you're facing now. What is the what are the next steps for you? Um, I think the main challenges I'm facing is probably not having the best role model. I mean, I have one or two, but I think I would like to have more. So I could understand understand the pathway of coaching much better to get more grasp of what I need to learn to be a better coach. I mean, I know I could do it, but I just want more role models to see. But yeah, I think that's the biggest challenge for me, that there isn't much role models here. Does it work for you that maybe you have to go outside of Grenada for these role models or is it more of a drive for you to have them within, within your own country? I mean, if that's the case that I have to go out to get it, then I will. But if I could get it here and out, then that's just a plus. Yeah. And likewise, Yasmin, we uh, kind of with your presentation, you sort of started off with the the barriers you faced as a as a player and how those barriers are coming down due to people like yourself um, getting into coaching. But now that you're on that coaching journey, you had that three or four experiences. What are you seeing as 
the next challenge is, are there still barriers there for you and for other women getting into football? Um, with me, I think, because um, I've seen the opportunities, there's a lot more opportunities and I'm seeing a positive. I think, you know, under in our club, we're getting more girls doing the courses. So I'm part of the London FA, I've seen their mission. I mean, it's really positive to seeing it. And I think we're going to have a lot more female coaches coming in the next couple of years. And there'll be a lot, many more role models. Um, you know, even within my players, some of them, you know, are, are already role models without being doing any of the courses. They're so, um, you know, one of ours, I think she's on here, Tabor. She was a top goal scorer. This is her first Muslim in our league. And she was a top goal scorer. She with 21 goals. It was an amazing. And, you know, she inspires me. You know, and she inspires other people. So even just players and stuff, it's come in and more people. We started with five girls. Now we have, I have, I think, 25, 26 women and um, got two teams. And got a third team we want to submit because of the lockdown. We couldn't, but it is um, is good. And I can see it growing. And I think there is a lot of um, new people. Um, a lot of new role models will be coming through. I've seen so many more coaches now. And like yourself, thank you for the opportunity of these webinars and stuff. These, this was what it's about. People are joining, seeing Twitter, sharing it. People are like, oh, I didn't know there was a female coach, you know, or there's a Muslim coach. So it's good, a lot of um, positive. See, it's like a lot on people like yourself then to get the word out. You sort of mentioned that the, the media and just creating, sharing these stories are are really a, a huge part of inspiring other people to to follow in your footsteps. Yeah, um, it's there, there is there. We just have to make sure people know it's there. We need to know that the opportunities are out there. We just need to help them find it and you know, use the media, whether it's social, um, Twitter or Instagram, you know, we need to use it productively um, you know, so people know that there is these sessions. A lot of people say, oh, I didn't know you had a club um, you know, when I tell them. So, I mean, there's still so much to do, but it's out there. We just need to make sure that they're aware it's there. I mean, with, with yourself, Helen, you're uh, on, on a quite incredible journey. Um, I imagine, uh, like you say, when hope inspired you to continue on a coaching pathway, um, I can't imagine you ever thought it would take you to the Faroe Islands. I can't imagine you ever thought anything in life would take you to the Faroe Islands. <laughs> but, but there you are. And... Um, I think um, I think it's one of those things. You you just you just have to have that sense of well, what what do I want to get out of my coaching career? You know, like also, you're never really good enough. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's so many there's so many things that you need to improve on, but sometimes it's really important to um, change your environment to improve it. You know, like. If, if you haven't got the right types of, um, maybe the, not the right support around you, or maybe you, you are being passed up for opportunities, you know, like I, I know a few coaches, female coaches, and, and they seem really good, but they don't feel that they're being given the opportunities at their clubs and they're being passed over. And that's, that's their honest held belief. So sometimes I, I just thought to myself, well, I, I have to, I have to make it work. And that, that means that I have to come outside of my comfort zone because I want to get better. I want to have more experiences, but quality experiences. So each move shouldn't be just, you know, the same as the last one. Each move should be purposeful, you know, because at the end of the day, we, we don't know, um, you know, we don't know how long we're going to get those opportunities and we have to try and really keep knocking on those doors and, and forcing ourselves to get better, you know, find the role models, make someone your role model, even if she didn't know she's your role model. And, you know, I've, the opportunities are there, but it's just, it's hard to find them. So being in a place like the Faroe Islands, for me, it, it was too good to turn down for my personal growth, you know? So that, that, was, the, that was the reason it, it had to be done. And that's the same as most of the other jobs that I've taken, you know? I'm trying to improve as a coach and I've got a lot of improvement to make and I, I don't want people to think that 
I'm just there because I'm a female coach, which is sometimes the case, you know, so I, I really just want to try and get better. And yeah, finally, could I um, sort of ask if there's uh, one thing that you would like to change within the football culture where you are in Grenada, what would that be? Uh, sorry, that's for, uh, for Koi. If, uh, uh, if there's one thing you would like to change within your football culture in Grenada, what would that be? Um, probably just for coaches to take criticism and uh, take these criticism and turn it into something positive, which could also help the players. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, Yasmin, same question. Um, from in the community that you're working in, what are the what are the what would be the next step? What would be you'd like to see as a the next change that would make a, a big difference? Um, I think just getting more more coaches through um, South Asian coaches, um, particularly. Um, and players as well so we have the thing is we have a lot of players but we have lack of coaches and so many clubs have approached me and I have to turn them down and it's I mean I want to help as many people as I can but there's only so much I can do myself for so priority is just getting more female coaches especially within the community I think they do sometimes think if they have South Asian coach they, or a Muslim coach they can you know they the parents will feel maybe a bit more comfortable. So a lot of clubs um, are approaching me and I have to turn them down because there's only so much I can do. So I'm hoping that we have more female coaches. So then, because the girls are there, all the young girls are there, the, demand, the girls are there, it's just the coaches. And we can't grow until we have enough coaches. So I think I want to see more coaches coming through so we can actually cater for these younger girls that I want to play. Fantastic. And, and Helen, I will give you the final word on that. Mm, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think the English FA are very, very good. I think they're very good in trying to be progressive and forcing things through, which sometimes makes people uncomfortable. But you don't get change if you're kind of whispering about it sometimes. And sometimes you've, you've got to be really forceful. I think English FA do that really well in more recent times. Um, the sort of change, I think, that maybe making it a little bit more um, seen as a as a profession. You've got a lot of, I think, a lot of really good people who are working, especially like at the grassroots level, where there there is there is there are funds that there are well there there, are, there is money there, but you've got a lot of people there, a lot of coaches who are working, and 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 people don't see that they're not getting paid. And you've got a lot of females who have come out of the game and, and they, they might be coaching at their local club and, and they're not getting paid. I think for, for retention, you, you have to make it clear that this is a viable profession for you rather than volunteering. And, you know, I had a friend who said, Helen, I can get you a job and I might even be able to get you paid. And I was like, yeah, because <laughs> why would I not get paid? I think making it clear that this is this is a profession and it's one that should be a realistic opportunity for for the women who are taking part in the sport. Um, you know, looking at the women's league, there's so many, there's so so few women. So it would be good if we just saw some more women actually getting paid and being treated as professional coaches. Yeah, 